So trying to prove red on nicotine, we want to prove the Reed's representation theorem. So let's just recall a couple of things. So we were talking about Hilbert spaces. So L2 of a measure, let's use rho for that measure because we'll use rho again in a second. L2 of rho is a Hilbert space. Hilbert space. Um, what does that mean? It means we have an inner product, Fg. Why is that inner product well defined if two things are in L2? Cauchy Schwartz, yes. I'm just trying to get you to say oh, yeah. Cauchy Schwartz. Okay, Cauchy Cauchy <coughs> Schwartz. I guess I'm supposed to say Bunimovich, and there's there's a oh, there's a yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> uh, not Bunimovich. What am I saying? Um, I'm blanking on the name. Yeah. There's a there's a variety of of names that that go along with Cauchy Schwartz. Um, here we call it Cushy Schwartz. Um, right, Hilbert spaces, Cushy Schwartz, linear linear operators. So let's talk about linear operators. So if L, um, so given uh, L two element G, G is in L two. We have the linear operator that takes F and spits out the inner product of F with G. So this is a linear operator. Hilbert spaces have to be separable or something, or second class? So Stein, Shikarchi insists on separability. Other people don't, and then they say this Hilbert space is separable when they when they want to okay. use separability. And is L two of rho separable? Yes. Okay. Be so why? What what is separable mean? Oh, just a, a metric space. Me uh, metric space is separable if there's a dense countable subspace. Just like Q. So do something with rational. Um, exactly. Like uh, like step functions yeah. generated from rectangles whose corners are at, at the rationals. L2, sorry, L2 of RD is separable. Right. And in general, whether or not L2 of X with the measure is separable is delicate and depends on uh, delicate things about X. Okay. okay? So um, that's one reason I'm sort of avoiding the topic. And so is there a condition on X that gives you a separability? There are a number of conditions that are, yes. Like it could be any space, not necessarily topological? Um, mm -hmm. Well, yes, it could be. So for a general measure space, when is a measure space, when is L2 on a measure space separable? Uh, that depends on, like you were starting to say, second countability. I don't want to get into these things, but. Uh, set theoretic properties of X. But RD is separable because we have rationals sitting in there and, and we can prove it. Um, I wasn't even going to go there because all the things that we're going to prove about uh, Hilbert spaces, we don't need the separability. Right. So, Sainz-Chikarchi assumes separability, let's just, uh, yeah. We don't need it, so let's not talk about it. Although we've talked about it now for a while. Um, <laughs> this is a linear operator, it's continuous. Oh, right, I wanted to make a point. It's continuous. Continuous means if... Right. And these are two different types of convergence. This is convergence in the Hilbert space. So I'll write H for the Hilbert space. <laughs> in other words, Fn minus F in, in the norm of the Hilbert space converges. And this is... Well, you have a linear operator in general to another Hilbert space, but for us, it's it's uh, a complex number. So this is complex numbers converging to other complex numbers. Okay, uh, bounded. Bounded is that. So what's the operator norm? This is the operator norm. Uh huh. The absolute value of function norms. Uh, LF. Uh, over the, uh, over the abs norm. Right. Which, which is equivalent to F not, even, not being zero. We always have equivalence classes. That's right. 
That's right. So a general Hilbert, this is, I'm sort of mixing what's true for a general Hilbert space and what's true for L2. For L2, we don't have functions, we have classes so that if it's uh, zero, then it's zero almost everywhere, but almost everywhere is the function. So I really mean the class. And this is, you can define this for any finite space. That's right. That's right. So a general, if you have an operator, a linear operator. And a norm. And a norm, then this is what people mean by the operator norm. Okay, and because of the scaling, because this is linear, if I scale f by a constant, this also scales by the same constant. So this is invariant under that scaling. So you could also take this on the things of norm 1, or the things of norm of a fixed norm. Okay. Um, and we were talking about which one implies which. Actually, you don't need Reese representation theorem to see. This is much simpler. I was saying some, some nonsense last time. Um, well, let's just prove a, a quick lemma since we, let's fix this from last time. Uh, continuous if and only if bounded. It's, it's very, very simple. Okay, so in this direction, uh, which direction is this? Continuous implies bounded. Well, th the other direction is, is really immediate. Let's see why bounded implies continuous. If it's bounded, then L of Fn minus L of F is, because it's linear, Fn minus F, and because it's bounded, this is at most the operator norm. It's a different norm than the uh, times the Hilbert norm. And the assumption is that this goes to zero, so the whole thing goes to zero. So if it's bounded, then this number is, is finite. The operator norm is finite, and so if fn goes to f, then L of fn goes to L of f. That's continuity. The other direction is also very easy. It's really going to bother me. It's not Bunyakovich. What is the? Uh, Bunyakovich. Uh, Bunyakovsky. Thank you. Bunyakovsky inequality. Anyway, thank you. How embarrassing, and my countrymen. Um, uh, okay, so uh, how about continuity? Continuity implying boundedness. So if it's continuous, what does that mean? That means that Fn goes to zero implies L of Fn goes to zero. So this gets arbitrarily small. In particular, let's just unpack what this is, i.e. for all epsilon, including epsilon equals 1, there exists a delta such that if fn is less than delta, then L of fn is less than epsilon. That's what this convergence means. What does it mean for something to go to zero? It means that if I can make this within delta, then this will be within epsilon. But epsilon is 1. But what does that mean? Anything of norm at most delta has L norm at most 1. We can take the ratio and scale. Everybody see that? So continuous implies bounded. What is this? It's the ratio of L of Fn to Fn. And you can take it on balls of size 1, or you can take it on balls of size delta. So for all epsilon equals 1? Well, it's true for all epsilon. <laughs> what I'm about to say is true for all epsilon. So let's set epsilon to be 1. So can you take epsilon to just get a zero sequence? Like top all zero? So what I'm saying is any sequence which goes to 0. So, uh, ask your question again. Sorry, so you can just take epsilon to be the 0 uh, sequence? You can't take it to be the 0 sequence because in the definition of operator norm, <coughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
in the definition of operator norm, you don't want to divide by zero. Okay, so you want to you want to know that there is a sequence that goes to zero without touching zero. But that's so. This is the implication of continuity. In fact, all you need is continuity at zero. So continuity at zero implies boundedness. Okay. But of course, continuity implies continuity. And I assume at zero. it's not too hard to make a sequence of functions in L2 that'll go to zero. Well, you have uh, you have scaling. So you, get, you can take the same thing, the same function, which isn't zero, and multiply it by co arbitrary complex constants that are getting smaller and smaller, for example. Um, this is like, I mean, I don't know how, how important this is, but the book defines linear functionals over Hilbert spaces. Yes. And in general, like, do you need to be in a Hilbert space to define like, what a linear function well, is? So a linear function, in order to be linear, right, what does that mean? You have to be able to measure, uh, you have to be able to add things before and after you apply the function. So you need vector spaces on both sides. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for this functional to be linear, you have to know that something's happening to norms. So it could be a linear operator on norm space. It doesn't have to be on Hilbert spaces. I mention it because in like the homework exercise, like we have C, A, B, right? And that's in like not a Hilbert space. So like, and then we're still talking about linear functionals there. So are they thinking about like as a subspace of like yeah? So L2 a, or if you have a, if you have vector spaces, if you have maps on vector spaces, they're they're linear. So all you need to to define linearity is to be able to add things before you apply L and after you apply L, which means you have vector spaces and scale. Okay. So in general, a linear operator is something on from one vector space to another. In this case, our vector space is better than a vector space. It's a Hilbert space. And what we're mapping it to is the complex numbers, which is a nice vector space, nice complex vector space. OK? All right, so now um, one more little thing that we are going to need. So any questions on continuity versus boundedness? So that's why in Reed's representation, we can just assume continuity or boundedness or whatever, or, or continuity at 0. So our, uh, uh, what are the property of linear functionals, like, like, like if, uh, just, just what the property is about the linear function. What, what makes something a linear function? Yes. So it's linear. It's linear. Okay, so, um, well, let me state the Reed's representation theorem one more time, maybe. That will, Reed's representation theorem. So if L is a linear functional, so linearity, well, linear just means linearity. So if I take the sum of two things and I apply L, that's the same as taking L and adding it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's also the constant. So if you have a con complex constant, and you can, just you can pull it out. OK, so that's a, on, on a Hilbert space. Uh, H, um, which I will. Let's, let's not get into discussions of what I mean by Hilbert space. It's L2 uh, for me. Uh, then there exists a unique element of H, and it's continuous, and it's con linear, continuous or bounded, continuous functional on Hilbert space. Then there's a unique element such that L of F is equal to the inner product of F and G for all F. Okay, and hence the L2 norm of G is the operator norm of L. Okay, so let's say one other thing before we get into the proof of this, which is to talk about closed subspaces. So the first, the first step in this proof will be to study a certain subspace and uh, see that it's closed. So let's look at the, um, the kernel of this, the null space of L. So this is the set of F in your Hilbert space in L2, such that L of F is equal to zero. Okay, my claim is this is closed. S is closed. What does it mean for a subspace of a Hilbert space to be closed? So if I have a sequence Fn in S converges to F 
in H implies F is in S. In general, it's not sufficient to say that it's sequentially closed. Um, sequentially closed, you mean if I have a sequence just I mean, this crazy property. big space sequentially closed might not imply closed. Uh, in crazy, but these are vector spaces. Yeah, even in big vector spaces. Well, okay, so what is your definition of sequentially closed? That I mean that this is sequentially closed, and then closed is complement of an open or something. So what I mean by closed, my definition of closed for a vector space, for a, for a Hilbert vector space, I guess is what you're calling sequentially closed. Okay. okay. And then it, is because it just saying that it's, clo uh, it's closed in its topology? Or so this is just like a different definition? Than it's that. also closed in the in the sense that it's the pre like this condition is a closed condition. But what I, all I mean by closed, my definition of closed for the it's purposes of, yes. of this discussion is, is sequentially closed. Okay, we'll see that that'll be enough. Is it equivalent to take the complement definition to the prior closed? Well, we do have a norm and then we can have a topology. We do have a norm, so S we can have a topology. S is L inverse of a closed yeah. set, right? That's right. That's right. So, that so it, it's also true in, in this case, but now I want to, if we're talking about like general, you know, general Hilbert spaces can be a little bit wild. So now you're asking about, uh, have a topology so in the you do have a topology because you have a metric. The inner product gives you a metric that gives you a topology. So um, closed is supposed to sequentially close. Let's just focus on this definition of closed for subspaces of Hilbert spaces, okay? First of all, is this a subspace? It's clear, if I add two things and their L was zero, then zero, my multiply by constant, okay. Um, is this closed? Well, if I have a limit of things, if I have Fn going to F, and all the Fn's had L of F being zero, how do I prove that F has L equals zero? Why? Because I, are we assuming that L is continuous? Yes, that's, what, that's all I want you to say, okay? So this is, this is just <laughs> continuity. So proof L is continuous. Um, Nothing to prove. Also kind of a stupid question, but what are you calling a subspace? It's closed under what? Well, a subspace is just a subvector space. Subvector space. Yeah, so okay. this is just a subvector space. It's not like sub... Uh, not a Hilbert space or something. It's not a sub Hilbert space, although it is a sub. <laughs> I mean, it is a Hilbert, it space. Is a Hilbert space because it still has the inner product that it, that's induced from the Hilbert space. But by subspace, I just mean a sub vector space. Okay. Yeah. Which is a sub Hilbert space. Um, there was another question or comment? Or? No. Okay. So um, what I need to prove, so I need a, a little lemma here. Lemma. If S is closed, then um, that Hilbert space decomposes into S and its orthogonal complement. Okay, so what I mean by this, i.e., so let me break this into a couple of pieces. Um, so step one, well, maybe I should make this a little easier. Uh, i.e. for all f in h, there exists a unique g in s such that uh, f minus g is in s perp and, well, f is equal to, I guess this is kind of trivial, g plus f minus g. But, okay. Um, let's let's break that down a little bit. So what I want to say is, by the way, what is S perp? Of course, S perp is the set of all. Let's call them H maybe. Uh, I want to try to keep my. Yeah, okay, let's call them G's. G in H, such that the inner product of F and G is zero for all F in S. Right, the usual meaning of of this. 
I mean, you, you know the picture that I, the picture is obvious. If this is my Hilbert space, and this is my subspace S, then S perp is kind of the normal to the, the Hilbert space, the, the subspace. Okay? So that's this uh, direct kind of decomposition. So um, what I want to know, so IE, here's what, I'm, here's what I mean by this, or here's what we'll prove. For all H in H, step one, there exists a unique element F0 in S, which minimizes the distance to H. So such that um, the infimum over H of these distances, H minus F, as F ranges over the subspace, is realized by uh, F0. Okay, so there's a unique element in the, so for any point, uh, how do I, how do I illustrate this? I guess it's kind of trivial. If this is, okay, now here, if this is H here somewhere, then there's a unique point F0 which is closest to it among all points in S. Uh, two, part two, is uh, H minus F0 is in S perp. Um, and, and that's it, i.e. Uh, H, H minus F0 inner product F is zero for all F in S. Okay, so I'm just spelling out what this decomposition, what this orthogonal decomposition means. Any questions on the statement? This is like what happens to finite dimensional vector spaces except we're doing it for Hilbert spaces. Do we, Let's, we're gonna prove this. Do we really need completeness? Or can it just work for any inner product space? Um, do we need, co so do you mean, do we need the closedness of S? Oh, no, like, sorry, I meant like, because Hilbert space, it's a complete inner yes. product space, right? But can we do it for any inner product space? Um, for any inner product space, no, I'm definitely going to be using limits. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be using the fact that limits converge. Yeah. Okay. How do I get up this whole thing on, on one... Okay, well, you know what we're trying to prove. Actually, this is what we're trying to prove. So starting here, this is the lemma. So I can slide this up. Proof. Okay, um, this is very easy. So suppose let D equal the infimum over F in S of H minus F. Okay, this is some number. If D equals zero, F is in S. then H is a limit point of S and S is closed. Or H, yeah. yeah. Then H is a limit point of S, right? There's a sequence of F's that get closer and closer in the norm to H, yeah. but S is closed. So it, uh, H is a limit point of S implies H is in S, and then we're done because h minus h realizes the distance zero. Okay, I'm proving part one now, proof of part one. Um, if not, else d is bigger than zero, and there exists some sequence of fn's, there exists a sequence of fn's in S with h minus fn going to d. Okay. Um, now, so um, the F ends are going to D. So we have a uh, let's let's prove the, the parallelogram. Do you know the parallelogram law? Let's make this an exercise. Time exercise. Exercise. Parallelogram law, which just says, I mean, this is completely trivial, a plus b squared plus a minus b squared is twice norm a squared plus 
I don't want b squared. Just multiply everything out. Uh, the, the cross terms cancel. Um, well, this is for positive numbers. Um, no, this is in general. But these are elements of a Hilbert space? Well, that's right. So let's do this for elements of a Hilbert space. Okay, so I'll apply with A equals uh, H minus Fn and B equals H uh, minus Fm. So my claim is that this sequence, F, Fn, is a Cauchy sequence. So I have these points. I have this Fn in S. Uh, their difference to H is going to a constant. Mm -hmm. I claim that means that they themselves form a Cauchy sequence. And it'll be clear what you do. You put in the you put h minus fn and h minus fm into the parallelogram law. And what do you get out? Here you get out um, 2h minus fn minus fm squared. Here you get Fn minus Fm. Exactly, squared. Fn minus Fm. That's what I'm trying to know goes to zero. Yeah. And that's equal to twice um, H minus Fn squared plus H minus Fm squared. I think the first one should be two H minus sum. Sum, thank you. And in fact, let's let's bring let's bring the two outside. <coughs> okay. So let's look at this. Fn minus Fm squared. Where is this going? That's going to d squared. This is going to d squared. So this is going to 2 d squared. This is going to 2 d squared. The whole, I think the 4 d squared because it's. 2 and then a 2. Yes. Thank you. 4 d squared. Perfect. <laughs> now, how about this? Fn plus Fm over 2 is something else in S. And so H minus anybody in S is no better than D. So when I subtract this to the other side, I get something that's no bigger than subtracting D squared times 4. So this is in S. Let's subtract it to the other side. So Fn minus Fm squared is less than, well, is less than or equal to uh, this thing. Uh, OK, I'll write it again. Twice h minus Fn squared plus h minus Fm squared minus 4 d squared. Because the biggest this can this is the the infimum is d. Oh, the infimum, the infimum over all of these oh, is d. Oh, okay, yeah. That was the initial assumption we had made. That was the initial assumption about the number d, is that h minus anybody in S is no uh, is no smaller than yeah. d. So when I move this to the other side with a minus sign. I can replace it by D. And where is this thing going? From above? Down to 2D squared with an extra 2. So the whole thing's going to 0. So the whole thing is going to 0. So Fn, the Fn's are a Cauchy sequence.
Let's do that again. Are you taking the limit as both n and m go to zero? Yes. So I mean, this could be put in more precise terms. That's right. Like, okay. That's right. I'm skipping a, a few words that I think can be filled in. Okay, so if D, which is this best distance possible, the closest distance we'll ever get to H in our subspace, is uh, positive, or either way, there's always a sequence, but if it's, if it's not positive, then we're done. If it's positive, there's a sequence. Use the parallelogram law to show that, in fact, that sequence is a Cauchy sequence, which means it converges. So this is where I'm using uh, completeness, which implies Fn converges to F in H, but S is closed. Uh, let's call this F0 in H, but H is closed, S is closed, so F0 is in S. Okay? So that is the first. Uh, should I draw this picture again? Maybe I drew it too small. No, you know, you know what's going on. Okay. Parallelograms. You want me to draw a parallelogram for the parallelogram law? No, you, you, you're joking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So what has that shown? Let's go back up here. We see that if you look at the infimum over these distances, that will be realized by an element of S. I have to show that, it, that that element is unique, and then I have to show this orthogonality. So I have to show that that element is unique. Um, so I have a question. Uh, like, um, we, we show that this is Cauchy, and hence it has a limit. Yes. But why do we know that it attains exactly the, the infimum? Ah, you tell me. So the question was, we know that this family of functions, uh, family of elements in the Hilbert space Fn, converges to somebody, and we know that somebody's an S. Why can we then conclude this equality? Well, it's because uh, Fn converges to F0, so the norm of Fn minus H converges to the norm of F0 minus H. Yes, the triangle inequality is one way of seeing it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so we need to know that it's unique. So, if there's another limit, so if if h minus f zero is equal to h minus f zero prime, and f zero f zero prime are in S, and both of these are the smallest, then Same thing again. Triangle inequality in both directions. <laughs> right? This is at most H minus F0 prime plus F0 minus F0 prime. And same thing the other way. So this, this difference is actually zero. We have an upper bound and a lower bound. Um, um, oh, sorry. I think it's uh, a, a, H, H minus F0. I think it's yeah. I don't think it's H, H minus right, right, right. It's not, Sorry. It's not. F prime minus F0 is H is at most, um, I, want, I want this with a minus sign. Actually, I have a better proof. Which no, F0 minus F0 prime. Yes, yes. Let, let me, uh, I have a, an even slicker argument for uniqueness. Like Let me come back to it. Let me come back. Was that? Did you take a convex <laughs> combination? Um, I'm going to use part two to prove the uniqueness. Okay. I'm going to use part two to prove the uniqueness. That's an even slicker way of proving the uniqueness. Okay, let's prove part two. So again, what is part two? So we found one element. We don't know yet that it's unique. You can't see where I'm pointing. We found one element. We don't know its uniqueness. We're going to prove that it's orthogonal to everybody in S. And from there, it'll be very easy to see that uh, it's unique. Okay, so let's prove the, the orthogonality. So, um, so part two, so proof of two. I'm kind of running out of 
position. How about that? Does that work? Okay, so proof of two. So we have this H minus F zero. We want to know um, what this inner product is. So let's, let's just write U for H minus F zero. And let R be an element of R. And let's compute um, F zero minus R F. This of course is in S, since S is a linear space. And let's compute, look at the norm of H minus F zero minus RF. We know that this is at least H minus F zero. Sorry. We can't even read that anyway. H minus F zero. Right? Just because anybody is bigger than, this is the infimum. This is another element of S. Okay? But let's multiply this out. What is this? Um, we get H, let's, let's group it into H minus F zero squared minus so there's an R squared F squared plus R squared F squared. And what's left over is a H minus F zero um, times RF and an RF times H minus F zero. So that's twice the real part of R times um, H minus F zero F. And in fact, the R I can pull all the way out. So tell me if you believe this. I'm just opening up the square, but I'm regrouping into this is one group and this is another group. Is everybody following? No. I don't follow yet. Okay. So I'm, I'm taking this square, I'm opening the square. Square is just, I have a bilinear product. So it's this thing times itself. And I'm going to group it as this part times itself, this part times itself, r squared norm f squared. And then I have a h minus f0 times rf. And I have a rf times h minus f0, which is the conjugate. So when I add the two, I get the real part, uh, twice the real part. You're getting that from the inner product? From the sesquilinear structure of the inner product. OK. OK, so if you reverse, if you have the integral of f times g bar, and you put in g bar, g times f bar, that gives you the complex conjugate. So you're adding this thing and its complex conjugate, that's just twice the real part. Okay. Now, if, um, so there, there's two things that we'll want to do. We'll want to send r to zero, but I want to know if we should send it from the left or from the right. Uh, because you see, uh, my argument will be Here's an R squared. So there's an H minus F zero squared on both sides. Let's, let's just uh, cancel that out. But I want to do it in a way that preserves what's going on. Let, so that implies R squared F squared plus two R times the real part of H minus F zero F is non-negative. I just subtracted h minus 0 squared from both sides of the inequality. Everything is real. I claim this can only happen, and this is true for all r. I claim this can only happen if this thing is 0. If h minus f 0 f has real part which is positive, Then I take R to be small negative, send R to zero from, from being small and negative. For large values of R, sorry, for small values of R, R squared is much smaller than R. And so this is much more negative. So this is a negative number times a fixed positive number. And that can't be 
bigger than zero for all values of r. But how do we know how normal bath compares to, the, to that real part? It doesn't matter, it's fixed. It's not moving. f is fixed, norm of f is fixed. This is a fixed number. So now I have a quadratic polynomial, r squared plus twice r times a number that's bigger than zero. Yeah. And when r is negative, that number cannot, this is not a, a positive quadratic form. Conversely, if this coefficient is negative, I get a contradiction when r is slightly positive. Okay, that's a positive times a negative, and this will be the dominant term asymptotically, because r squared is of a lower order. Does everybody see that? So r squared is lower order than r, so we get a contradiction. And the only way we don't get a contradiction is if the real part is zero. Then I have to do a separate argument for the imaginary part. Okay, so that implies uh, real part is zero, real part of this inner product. And then you run again, run again with r replaced by ir to get the imaginary part to be zero. get the imaginary part? So when you run the argument again with an ir instead of an r here, what comes out is an ir plus an i bar r, which is a minus r. So you get, you get this thing minus itself with a bar when you have an i in front. And that catches twice the imaginary part instead of twice the real part. So then it's the same thing, just with imaginary part, and then you run the same exact argument. Let me leave that as an exercise. I think you can do it. In fact, it's a good exercise. Good exercise. To see how this argument went. OK, so you get this quadratic relation. This is a, this is a def deformation argument. It's a very powerful argument, actually, technique that you should uh, have it in your tool belt. So you have this f, which is optimal. You want to know that that forces some orthogonality, so you deform it by a little bit. If you have some, uh, somebody else that you're trying to show your orthogonal to, well, deform it a little bit, and uh, that deformation to, in lower order, in uh, up to lower order terms, forces this inner product to be actually zero. No, we're a little confused. So take me back to where you lost. Yes. Um, so, so you're trying to show that f, you want to show that h minus f is orthogonal. If there's orthogonal to any f in S. Any f in S. So why are you doing a perturbation to f not and not h minus f not? You said the technique is to per perturbate f not, right? Um, I want to know that f not minus r f is in S. I'm using. The fact that, so that's why I think of this as a perturbation of f naught. But you're right, once I come here, I turn because, because it's linear. Oh, so it does become a perturbation. It does become a perturbation of h minus f naught. Okay. I'm playing these two against each other. Okay. But I need to know that this is an f in s in order to conclude this lower bound that we got from part one. Right. And that's what cancels out on both sides and leaves me with a quadratic that has to be non negative. That can't be if this coefficient is, doesn't have the right sign. But there is no right sign, because I can be going from the left or from the right. So the only way that happens is this coefficient is 0. And when you're doing the argument for when the real part is greater than 0, and you're sending r to 0 from the left, why is it sufficient to only send it from the left and not the right? Well, if I send it from the right, I don't get a contradiction. If this is positive. This is positive. So, I mean, that this case is positive. does exist, but you don't get the contradiction there. It exists on the I don't learn anything from there, okay, right. from that direction. From this direction, I learn that this is a positive times a negative, and this negative for small values of r is asymptotically bigger than this one. For small enough values of r, this term will be lower, will be less in absolute value than this term. And so it doesn't matter how big f is, eventually, for small enough values of r, this thing will dominate as long as it's not zero. Uh, for the imaginary part, you would want to 
You don't want the modulus to go to zero. No, no, it's literally the same argument. You literally get just a plus uh, instead of a real part, you get an imaginary part if you replace r by i r, right up here. Oh, right. That's the exercise I want oh, to yeah, test. Oh, yeah, it's, it's one axis. So. Okay. Exactly. You're changing the axis along which you're. Only together do you get the. And to get right, so once we prove that the real part is zero, and then we prove that the imaginary part is zero, the complex number, which has real part and imaginary part zero, is okay. So what have we learned? Let's go back to the statement. We have learned the statements right here. We have learned that h minus f zero is in S perp, so its inner product must be zero for any element of S. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're almost done. Now I'm going to show you the, the uniqueness in a, in a slick way. So now, if uh, F0 prime is another in S has H minus F0 equals H minus F0 prime, Well, it's an S. It's an S. That means um, by part B, H minus F0 inner product with F0 prime is zero. zero. And so now we can use the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, if two things are orthogonal, then they're norms. So when I add these things or subtract these things, so H minus F0 prime squared is equal to h minus f0 prime, uh, f0 squared plus f0 minus f0 prime squared. So I have two vectors that are orthogonal. The norm of h minus f0 prime, it, it's an orthogonal walk. Uh, a squared equals what is it? C squared is A squared plus B squared is C squared? OK, you know what I'm saying. The walk to F0 from H minus F0 can be done in an orthogonal fashion, because this vector and this vector are, are orthogonal. But these are both, but these are equal. One of those words, P theorem. Pythagorean theorem, P-Y-T-H. Pythagorean theorem. Okay. All right. I'm trying to rush to get to reads, but that's a mistake because we end up going slower when I rush. So let me slow down. Any questions on what we, let's go over what we've proved. So this is the uniqueness, right? Everyone agrees. These two things are equal, but this is, but these two are equal, which means this distance is zero, which means they agree. So let's go back to the statement that we were trying to prove, which is all the way back here. If you have a closed subspace of a Hilbert space, then that Hilbert space can be decomposed into <coughs> S and its orthogonal complement. In other words, any F has a unique G in S, so that G minus F minus G is in S prime. Okay. So I'm getting blank stares. Plus means is, is this means union? The meaning of this symbol is this, is this statement. Okay, This is the orthogonal decomposition of H into S and S per. In general, if S isn't closed, then this isn't true. Not only does the proof fail, but actually, so S perp perp is the uh, smallest closed subspace containing S. But if S is already closed, then, then we're good. OK. Uh, that means we can prove reads, and then in one line we can prove, well, in, in one page we can prove Radonikodim. I might have to do it next time. But I think we can do, we can do reads now. 
the clock is just wrong. Oh, that has no bearing at all. Yeah. On <laughs> you got 10 minutes. Yeah. But it miraculously, the, minutes are so the minute so. is actually accurate, but just by accident. <laughs> <laughs> it is an accurate measure of the minute. Okay. So I need to use this. And I want to go all the way back to Reese. So let's go back to the statement. I have a continuous linear functional. I want to know that the only way that that happens is like this. Okay? I have my space S, which is the null space of the linear functional. Okay, so proof of Reese. I think I can do this. Proof. Nope, I can't. <laughs> but I can do this. Origami. Origami. <laughs> proof of Reese. Okay. So we have this closed subspace. Um, if this closed subspace is equal to H, then we're done. Then L is always zero, and I can just take G equals zero, and we're done. So else, there exists some element, let me call it H, in S perp, H is not the zero vector. Okay? If it's not the zero vector, I can rescale, rescale, so that H has norm one. It's not the zero vector, it has some norm, rescale it so its norm is one. Is it, for what P is it true that uh, LP norm of something equals zero and the thing is non-negative implies the thing is zero almost everywhere? If the LP norm is zero, mm -hmm. then the integral of that thing absolute value to the pth power is zero, mm -hmm. which means the function absolute value to the pth power is zero almost everywhere. But to be absolute value to the p power, so any p. So any p is yeah, up to almost everywhere. All LP norms are norms, or whatever it's called, non-negative. Are uh, what's it called? If the, if a norm is zero, then the thing is zero. Positive definite. Positive definite, I guess. Yeah, I thought we had another word for it. Anyway, <laughs> words are obviously not my forte. That's why I do math. Um, okay. All right. So we have this element H, right? Everybody agrees we have this element in the orthogonal complement. What I claim is that we're basically done. So I claim, claim is that if I take G equal to L of H bar times H, so this is a complex number, I'm going to multiply it by H. Uh, I claim that that's what G is. G works. Okay, why does this work? Well, let's look at the difference. Look at, so proof. <coughs> look at, if this is G, if this is the correct thing for G, let's look at LF um, minus uh, F in a product G. And let's see what this is for all um, for all uh, f. Okay. Um, there's a slick way of doing this. Do I want to do the slick way, or do I want to just improvise the way? Let me give you the slick way. No, no, I should improvise it. Well, let's look. Let's look at what this is. Okay. What's that? Why not both? Why not both? All right. Let's let's look at what this is. Look at this thing. I, I want to know that this thing is zero, right? For all that. So this is L of F minus what was uh, what was G. So this is F inner product L of H bar times H. Let's pull out the L of H. So I have L of H as a constant. Um, so I, sorry. Yeah, it comes out as the conjugate. Uh, right, so this is L of F minus 
L bar L of H, yeah. no bar, mm. times F inner product H. Okay? Um, but F, an arbitrary F, we can decompose into something in S and something in the perp. So F is equal to, should we call it U plus V? U is in S, V is in S perp. So then what is L of F? L U plus L V. Right, it's L of U plus L V, but L of U is, S is the null space of L. Zero. So this is just L of V. Um, L of H is L of H. And F inner product H is U inner product H and V inner product H. But H is in S. H is in S perp. So U inner product H is nothing. And this is V. Uh, v inner product H. Okay? Um, so let's look at this number. What I claim is that um, yeah, what uh, is this slick way of doing this? Let me give you the slick version and then we'll, we'll unfold the unslick version. So let U, this is unrelated U, let me call it W. <laughs> Let W be L of F times H. Wait, is this related to the last one? We will be in a second. This is what I this is what I really want to take. Because somehow I have to get the interaction between L of F and you see I have L of F, which is a the problem with with this is that um, the problem with this is that this is on the level of constants, and what I want to prove is something on the level of the Hilbert space, where I can apply L. I need to apply L one more time, but I can't apply L to C. I'm already in C. Mm -hmm. So let's start with something where I take a constant and I multiply it by H, and I take another constant and I multiply it by, again, something in the Hilbert space. So this is in the Hilbert space, and I can apply L to this. So what is L of W? Zero, because this constant pulls out and I get L of H, and this constant pulls out and I get L of F. I get L of F times L of H times minus L of H times L of F as complex numbers. So this is L of F, L of W is zero. That means W is in S. That means W and H are orthogonal. So the inner product of H and W is zero. But when we unfold what that is, the inner product of H and W, let's put that in here. That's L of F times h inner product h. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it the other way around. Um, w and h, the inner product of w and h, so that I don't have to put bars over everything. <laughs> right? w, I'm sticking in w, inner product h. So the first term is this, h inner product h, minus l of h times f inner product h. H inner product H is norm H squared. That's one. That's one. L, H, and H I can pull together. I'll pull the L of H into the H with a bar. That gives me G. And what we just learned is that L of F is equal to F inner product G. Okay, so that's why the naive version doesn't work. This first approach is trying to do something on the level of complex numbers. I need to be able to apply L one more time. So instead of doing it on the level of complex numbers, you put the complex numbers as coefficients. This is, the, this is why it's slick. You put the complex numbers as the coefficients in the Hilbert space so that you can apply L one more time. Does that make sense? So what we've learned is that L of F is equal to the inner product of F with G. We also learned something interesting that you can start with any h of norm or no, any h yes. and take take it to L of h bar over norm of h times h and you get the same thing no matter which h. Let me unpack what you just said. You take any h in s per. Yes, in s per. Take it to L of h bar over norm of h times h. L of h bar over norm of h times h. 
Yeah. Norm H. Um, so I'm just normalizing it at the same time. If I'm normalizing it, then I'd have to normalize both of them. But yeah. Oh, I yeah, I forgot that elevator part contains yeah. Yeah. So this it's always the same no matter what. It's always what the same H no matter what. H. In S bar. Yeah. In S per. Yeah. Why why Question. does it prove to simply to use the fact that the quadrilateral score that we can mind? I mean that's I words I'm using this. Say it one more time. Um, well, we have to prove that. We'd have to prove it, right? Um, okay. Uh, so, so this implies reads. So why does this give us what we wanted again, like this last part? Because L of F is equal to the inner product of F with G. Yes. And what we were trying to prove is that L of F is equal to the inner product of F with some oh, okay. G. What about uniqueness? So let's prove uniqueness, okay? Um, the uniqueness is again, uh, how am I doing this? Just get on the page. The uniqueness is if there's another G, well, the uniqueness is uh, just stick in so the uniqueness is if I stick in, so if f of g is equal to f of g prime for all f, then f inner product g minus g prime is equal to zero for all f. So I can take f equals g minus g prime Uniqueness is very straightforward. Okay, I have to let you go, but we will do Radon Nicodem. Now that we have the Reese representation theorem, Radon Nicodem will be what about the two lines. Norm? Oh, the operator norm, that's, that's just because the operator norm of this thing we already worked out was equal to G. Oh. Right, because again, you can stick in, so by Cushy Schwartz, that's an upper bound, mm -hmm. and sticking in G for F gives you the, uh, the equality. Okay. Does everybody follow that? The question was, how do we know that the operator norm of L is G? And that's, that's the answer. All right. Very good. Have a nice weekend.